Well, good afternoon and welcome uh, to this, the 2010 Aaron Lecture at Dartmouth. Uh, my name's Lucas Swain. I'm an associate professor here in the Department of Government and currently the convener of Dartmouth's Legal Studies faculty. Uh, today's event is co-sponsored by the Rockefeller Center, by the Dartmouth Lawyers Association, and by Dartmouth's uh, Legal Studies faculty. And I'd like to thank Sadna Hall and Sarah Morgan for their invaluable assistance in helping to bring this occasion together. By way of background, briefly, the Aaron Lecture, for your interest, was established in 1996. It's named in honor of Roger S. Aaron, who is a member of the class of 1964. Its broad purpose under the aegis of Dartmouth's Daniel Webster Fund is, quote, to advance the study of the role of, just, of law and justice and ethics and public policy in the lives of individuals and society, unquote. Since its inception, the Aaron Lecture has been delivered by such notable figures as Anthony Kronman, Owen Fiss, Brian Tierney, Michael Perry, Robert Ellickson, and Stephen Macedo, among others. This year, we are delighted to have as our Aaron Lecturer, Professor Nancy Rosenblum from Harvard University. She is a leading expert in political theory and the history of political thought, and she's a truly remarkable scholar of liberalism and constitutional law. Professor Rosenblum did her undergraduate and graduate studies at Harvard, and she taught for several years at Brown University, where she was Henry Merritt Riston Professor in the Political Science Department, and also director and founder of Brown's Initiative for the Study of Values. At Brown, she also initiated the Foundations of Legal Studies program, which was wildly successful during her tenure there, but she returned to Harvard in 2001, where she's a mainstay of their government department. She teaches courses at the graduate and undergraduate level, including a course called Legalism, which is in the moral reasoning core curriculum at Harvard. Professor Rosenblum has published important articles in a wide variety of academic journals, and she's written four books. The first, Bentham's Theory of the Modern State. Second, Another Liberalism, Romanticism, and the Reconstruction of Liberal Thought. Third, there's the award-winning Membership and Morals, the Personal Uses of Pluralism in America, which won the American Political Science Association's uh, David Easton Prize, and most recently, On the Side of the Angels, an Appreciation of Parties and Partisanship, which came out in 2008 on Princeton University Press, and it's a breezy 600 pages in length. By way of other work, Professor Rosenblum has edited a wonderful little book on Thoreau, which we Dartmouth people greatly appreciate. Uh, it's part of a Cambridge series on history of political thought, and she's edited and contributed to the following works, Liberalism and the Moral Life, which we employ in the classroom here at the college, Obligations of Citizenship and Demands of Faith, a book co-edited with the legal scholar Robert Post entitled Civil Society and Government from Princeton in 2002, and most recently, Breaking the Cycles of Hatred, Memory, Law, and Repair, co-edited with Martha Minow of Harvard Law School. She's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. She is Senator Joseph S. Clark, Professor of Ethics in Politics and Government Theory at Harvard, and she is the chair of Harvard's <coughs> Department of Government, no less. Her lecture today is entitled Partisanship and Independence, the Moral Distinctiveness of Party ID. I note for your interest that we'll go to 6 p.m. after which there will be a book signing, so please do feel free to acquire one of those fine texts and have it signed afterwards. And please join me in welcoming to Dartmouth, Nancy Rosenblum. Thank you, Luke. Can you all hear me all right? I'm honored to uh, have been invited to deliver the 14th Aaron Lecture. I'm grateful to the donor, to the Rockefeller Center, its director, Andrew Samwick, to 
Sadna Hall and Sarah Morgan for organizing my visit to the Dartmouth Legal Studies faculty and the Dartmouth Lawyers Association. I'm also grateful to Professor Swain, whose dedication to this college and to academic affairs like this one reminds me, in the swirl of a frenetic semester, why we do what we do. My theme is the moral distinctiveness of party identity, and this theme goes against the grain. By the end of the talk, I hope that you'll uh, 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 agree that uh, political theory has something to add to this subject that's usually written about by pundits or political scientists or the growing industry of people who write in election law. So here we go. I'm going to talk for something under an hour, and then I hope to take your combative questions. In 1880, Henry Adams, the historian and the heir of two presidents, published a novel called Democracy. Adams' heroine, New York socialite Madeline Lightfoot Lee, suffers from ennui. She's lost interest in salons and in philanthropy and in business. She's resorted to desperate measures, Adams wrote. She reads philosophy in the original German. But still desperate, Miss Lee uh, transplants herself to Washington, where enthralled by the great game of politics, she's revived. That's literature. In political theory, by contrast, the story is one of persistent anti-partyism. Political parties and their partisan supporters are disparaged, if not actively despised. And they always have been. The canonical history of political thought is a record of relentless opposition to parties as institutions and of moral disdain for partisans. I've actually created a typology of the glorious traditions of anti-partyism that still resonate today. One tradition abhors parties as unwholesome parts that disfigure what should be a perfectly unified political community. And because parties have partiality and opposition as their whole purpose, they stand out amongst groups and associations as the most morally and politically objectionable, as worms in the bowels of the Commonwealth. There's a second anti-party tradition that accepts political pluralism, but abhors parties as magnifiers or inventors of cleavages, as fatally divisive. There have been some rare moments in the history of political thought of appreciation for parties, and they do have one classic defender, and that's Edmund Burke, of whom William uh, Goldsmith wrote in 7074, here lies good Edmund, who born for the universe, narrowed his mind, and to party gave up what was meant for mankind. Well, democratic theorists do more than just echo these traditions of anti-partyism. They're creative in their loathing. And they had to be, because only after elections were open to most citizens and run as contests to shape public opinion could parties be specifically decried as perverters of the democratic spirit. And the charges are familiar. Uh, parties are too responsive to powerful minorities. They're insufficiently responsive to powerless minorities. And above all, parties are routinely unresponsive to majorities. Parties are associated with personal and institutional corruption. And the main thing dividing dismal critics today is whether they see political parties as the agents of powerful corporate predators captured by special interests or as principals advancing their own sinister interests, extortionists involved in an elaborate influence peddling scheme. So it's small wonder that uh, aversions predominate. After all, party politics is so grimy, so mundane, so nakedly political. To arouse antipathy, it would be enough to say that parties are the creatures of politicians, men and women for whom politics is a business and a pleasure, and who are prepared to give and receive heavy punishment without flinching. As for partisanship, we recognize that partisan is an invective. The barb comes out of improbable mouths, a virtual reflex. And so while party activists do battle with one another, claiming to be on the side of the angels, in, and uh, critics demonize them all and praise independence, as their undisputed moral superiors. To orient us on this terrain of anti-partyism, it's helpful, helpful to understand that virtually every political pathology and every scheme for correcting the system by eliminating or circumventing parties and converting partisans into independents had its roots in the United States in the progressive era. And it's true. Bribery, bossism, patronage, and fraud, the key motivators of progressive anti-partyism, have been eclipsed. After 2000 uh, presidential elections, machine politics refers to the machinery to tabulate votes, not to boss tweed. Still, there is a remarkable continuity of progressive anti-partyism up to the present. So for example, contemporary democratic theorists who describe their work as non-ideal theory are progressives' heirs. They write often expressly as if we could have democracy without parties and partisanship. And the objects of their serious attention are self-styled public interest groups or social movements or direct democratic institutions like referenda or expert commissions 
or decision making by specially created deliberative polls or citizens' juries uh, with participants chosen to represent lay citizens and nonpartisans. In other words, in democratic theory today, partisans are absent from this exhaustive catalog of the associations that make democracy work. And progressive roots and borrowings are also pronounced among scholars of election law, which has emerged in the last uh, decade or so as a legal specialty. Leading scholars in the field adopt a very standard progressive theme, that the American two-party system is a duopoly, a cartel, that the ground rules of democratic elections set up political barriers to political competition from third parties or fusion parties or independent candidates, barriers to ballot act access like signature requirements or filing deadlines, and all of these are erected by the two major parties in what amounts to partisan self-entrenchment. And the payoff of this analogy between a party system and a commercial market is the accusation of party cartel that so neatly diagnoses what it is that these scholars feel is the main problem today, which is failure to perform the ritual cleansing born of competition. The market analogy directs the course that they think judicial uh, intervention should take, which is to apply the equivalent of antitrust law to the major parties. If we move from legal theory to practice, it's not hard to see that important issues in current constitutional law, uh, the court is not particularly friendly to parties. For example, the Supreme Court has many cases that illustrate the way in which it's thrown up wedges between political parties and their candidates. And I'll give just one example. I'll skip some of this. Um, this is true in campaign finance law, law today, but it's also true in controls over primary elections. And let me give you just one example. In 2004, Washington State uh, People's Choice Initiative, by initiative, voted to establish a very novel part, uh, par primary election scheme. And they called this a no, nonpartisan primary because candidates for office are identified on the ballot by their own self-designated party pre preference or by their status as an independent. And the top two vote getters then go on into the general election, even if the top two have designated their party preference as the same party. Well, the point I want to make here is that a political party in Washington state cannot prevent a candidate who is unaffiliated with it or even repugnant to it from designating it as his party preference on the ballot. And the party cannot designate its own preferred candidate as such on the ballot. Well, Washington state's Republican, Democratic, and Libertarian parties challenge the law, arguing that if left unrebutted, a candidate's claim that her views are aligned with the party can distort the party's image or shape the voters a view of what the party stands for, or hijack the party's message and goodwill, that voters are liable to assume that parties embrace or at least tolerate the views of the candidates who take on their label, and that the winner will be seen as the de facto party nominee. And in 2008, the Supreme Court upheld this Washington primary scheme, arguing that the parties can't complain of violations of their First Amendment right of association. They can't complain that this is unconstitutional, compelled association with candidates not of their choosing for the purely formal reason that the primary here doesn't actually choose the party's nominee for the general election. It simply winnows the field to two top vote getters regardless of their party preference. And Justice Scalia was a characteristically emphatic in his dissent in this case, and in this case I think right, where he says there is no state interest behind this law except dislike for bright colored partisanship. So all of this is a wind up to say that from the Supreme Court, where justices have consistently expressed the view that elections are about choosing an individual to hold an office, not about a party to control office, to palpable public distaste for parties. A third of survey respondents agree with the proposition that the truth is we probably don't need political parties in America anymore. And a third of voters uh, would prefer to see the candidates run as individuals without party labels. We get a sense of the scope, if not the flavor, of anti-partyism. Well, my focus this afternoon is going to be more circumscribed than anti-partyism. It's anti-partisanship. Anti-partyism and anti-partisanship are separable. We can appreciate partisanship in general in the sense of organized advocacy. You're a partisan of a cause, and yet despise political parties as vehicles, just as we can concede the usefulness of political parties and despise partisanship. For example, democratic theorists might glumly concede that parties are convenient mechanisms for reducing the transaction costs of democracy, and that while partisans are an admirable, some number of them are indispensable to realize the value of parties. But even this minimal concession 
is pragmatic and unexuberant and grudging, because at the same time, they echo progressives who insisted that if we have to have parties, at least voters should be nonpartisan, and who wanted to make independent and near honorific status. So my theme then is going to be anti-partisanship, more specifically uh, opposition to ordinary voters' identification with the political party and efforts to foster the political identity of independent. And I'm going to take sides, not between opposing partisans, but between partisanship and independence. I'm going to chip away at the moral high ground claimed by independence, and I hope I'm going to provide party ID with an iota of dignity. I'm going to cast partisanship as the morally distinctive political identity in representative democracy. And I'm going to argue that the commonplace of democratic theory today, that an intelligent and progressive democratic system depends on the ability of its supporters to attain a nonpartisan spirit, is exactly wrong. So let me go ahead then. Do you have these outlines? Great. Uh, let me go ahead then. I'm going to make three points each about independence and partisanship. And recall, my focus is on civilians, on we partisans though similar arguments extend to partisans' government. So independence first. In the United States today, independent is a distinct political identity. A response of no preference on surveys of political attitudes is widespread throughout advanced democracy. But the designation independent doesn't appear to have a counterpart elsewhere. Put another way, while over 90% of survey respondents agree with the statement, the best rule in voting is to pick the best candidate, regardless of party label, only some of these people elevate this profession into a proud label, into a proud self-designation, I'm an independent. I've been reading manifestos uh, this fall, and the author of the recent manifesto, We the Purple, she was a former editor of Christian Retailing Trade Magazine, put it very nicely. She wrote, we're not undecided. We have decided to be independent. Now, plainly, this label itself is inviting. Independence has a certain luster. The positive moral resonance of independence in the United States owes to a distinctive ideal of self-reliance in economic and social life. That is, citizenship requires men who have become accustomed to independence in action that comes with the responsibility of directing their own affairs. This is a, a quote from the 18th century. And this general civic ideal was transplanted into the soil of electoral politics. In one formulation, citizens, and I'm quoting, must be independent persons in both their political and civil roles who give and withdraw their votes from their representatives and parties as they see fit. And independence here meant more than that you're not def deferential to your social superiors. As voting became the ritual expression of citizenship, independence became increasingly aligned with political conduct, and it meant nonpartisan. And so from very early on, partisanship was cast as a kind of degraded citizenship, as abject dependence rooted in clientelism or capture or dumb loyalty. And enthusiasm for independence was rooted in this conviction that it was the predictor of responsible political behavior and that independence were voters persuaded, whereas partisans were voters bought. This civic ideal of independence is so pronounced in American political thought, and it gives luster to independence as anti-partisan and provides the permanent structure of anti-partisanship in American political life. Having said that, with the surge of independence in the last few decades, several variations of independence have, uh, have appeared. They were all in evidence in the election of 08, and I thought I'd give you my, my categories of independence as they've emerged. Fundamentalist independents avow that their anti-partisanship is not the result of dissatisfaction with current parties, but with any and all parties. They see party divisions as inherently too rigid to allow their personal judgment to be exercised over time. These are the fundamentalists, always uh, anti-partisan. Circumstantial independents present as a separate type. They see current parties as creating the wrong kinds of divisions, not those that in their individual judgment are politically important. One common complaint in the United States has been that parties are undifferentiated. They're mongrels, they're hodgepodges, they're centrist. And I like to quote Justice Powell's opinion in a Supreme Court case dealing with whether the National Democratic Party should be required, in violation of its own internal rules, to seat delegates from Wisconsin chosen by an open primary. And here's Justice Powell's assessment. He writes, if appellant national party, the Democratic Party, were an organization with a particular ideological orientation or political mission, 
the state law opening the organization to participation by persons with incompatible beliefs might interfere with the associational right of its founders. The Democratic Party, however, is not organized around the achievement of defined ideological goals. Well, things change, and today's circumstantial independence animus is captured by exactly the opposite dissatisfaction with parties. The partisans are ideological and extremist. And really, the only thing to note is how swiftly political complaints with the title dead center, the perils of moderation, have been supplanted with political complaints with the title like off center, right, extremist. Uh, so circumstantial independents refuse to identify with these errant conglomerations, nor it should be said with any feasible party division, and as such, they merge in practice, I think, with fundamentalists. There's a third type that, in some ways, politically today is the most interesting, and that's pragmatic independents. They want to bypass partisanship because it thwarts practical solutions to urgent problems. And the adjectives that these independents apply to partisan are nasty diminutives, pettiness, bickering, smallness. Candidate Obama repeated this sentiment, I think, in his campaign. He said, let's resist the temptation to fall back on the same partisanship and pettiness and immaturity that has poisoned our politics for so long. Well, this notion, just fix it. Don't worry about partisanship is a perennial feature of apolitical thought in America. And pragmatic independence is captured by the designation of some officials as the new action heroes, politicians like Arnold Schwarzenegger, who plays the role of fixer in a style approaching camp and who repeats at every turn, how about being reali realistic and just solving the problem? So independence animus has distinct contours today, but it's hardly unique to this polarized moment in American politics. There is a permanent structure to anti-partisanship that's shared by fundamentalist and circumstantial and pragmatic independence. It draws uh, for its resonance on the force of this long-standing civic ideal of independence. In the words of one proud independent, we've decided that we cannot be anything other than independent thinking, which is what, us, wh which is what drew us to this political persuasion in the first place. Right. Second point about independence. Progressives introduce the influential view that where the partisan is seduced or bought, the independent is a free agent. And supporters of party organization were characterized as ignorant or inert, or in the terms of the time, set in some deadly groove. The good people are herded into parties, Henry Adams wrote, and stupefied with convictions in a name, Republican and Democrat. The great progressive writer, Lincoln Steffens, was blunt. I don't see how any intelligent man can be a partisan. Today, the contrast is as much cognitive as it is moralistic, where partisans are judgment impaired, crippled by perceptual bias. The independent is a nimble, positive empiricist, cognitively mobilized. I love that phrase. The author of the odd book, Party Crashing, How the Hip Hop Generation Declared Political Independence, quotes a young black woman in her 20s, Charisma, saying, I'm a registered independent because I'm an independent thinker. Well, these assertions don't stand up to empirical scrutiny. Quote, far from being more attentive, interested, and informed, independents tend as a group to have somewhat poorer knowledge of the issues. Their image of the candidates is fainter. Their interest in the campaign is less. Their concern over the outcome relatively slight. This is a 40-year-old assessment, and by and large, it still holds. Pure independents are the least interested in politics, the most politically ignorant, the lightest voters. Escaped from the deadly groove, they disregard partisan <coughs> reference points in their own thinking. And because they also typically spend less time attending to politics and have fewer hooks for taking in new arguments or new information, the independents' considerations are more likely to be chaotic and ad hoc than partisans, rather than more coherent. And even a, presum even a presumably informed subgroup of independents, as leaning independents or my Harvard students are said to be, don't appear to <coughs> use more or different or better information than partisans or to be more deliberative or more cognitively mobilized. And so if independence begins to lose a little bit of its luster, it can be burnished again, and it is, by claiming an affinity to certain moral types that are familiar from political philosophy. Because of course, Philosophers vaunt independence, whether the ideal perspective is Socratic questioning or Hume's impartiality or a view from nowhere is the antithesis of a partisan position. And so laudatory representations of independence invoke these poses, and, uh, and I think they deserve at least a quick note of skepticism. For one, 
Escape from the Deadly Groove doesn't make an independent, bravely Thoreauian, guided by conscience, doing in every case what I think right. After all, conscientious or not, and there's no reason to think that independents are more moved by moral considerations or commands of conscience than others, they are reduced to choosing amongst courses that are arranged by others. Nor is there any warrant for casting independents as impartial observers <coughs> who bring appreciation of the limits of each side and balanced information to bear. As if independents are judicious umpires inclining victory to this side or that as they think the interests of the country demand. As if they are either uniquely motivated or uniquely equipped to judge the nation's interests. And finally, I think there's no warrant for viewing independence as specially attuned to the dynamic by which every political position derives its utility from the deficiencies of the other. This is John Stuart Mill's great account of political parties where he said, truth is a question of the reconciling and combining of opposites made by a rough process of a struggle between combatants fighting under hostile banners. On this view, independents are portrayed as the beneficiaries and carriers of the corrections that emerge from the clash of persons who actually believe these half-truths, who defend them in earnest and do their utmost. Well, some of you might say, have I focused on real-life anti-partisans and not grappled with independence as a regulative ideal? What if independents were disinterested judges of the pu public interest or intrepid citizens presenting themselves as antidotes to the furies of extremism or impartial observers and correctors of the deficiency of every party? Well, independence doesn't stand up in any case because even the most admirable lacks the moral distinctiveness of party ID that I'm going to talk about in just a minute. But moreover, independents are politically detached and weightless. And that's the third point I want to make. Along with independence as a generic, or as a general civic ideal, an escape from the deadly groove is weightlessness. What is partisanship? It's identification with others in a political association. We partisans organize and vote with allies, not alone. And if the great Italian uh, communist uh, Ignazio Saloni is right, that the crucial political judgment is the choice of comrades, independents don't make it. They are as detached from one another as they are from parties. Instead, the independent demands to be recognized as a unique individual who should express herself significantly in public as well as in private life. It's about self-expression, not forming a government. And New York Times columnist David Brooks, who uh, I read religiously, explained the disposition that made him a confessed conservative independent. He said, there's the repulsive force of teamism, which is the great corrupter of modern politics. It's the way people crush their own personalities and views in order to fit with the team. This is not quite romanticism, but it comes close. Independents are weightless, but they can be forgiven the illusion of efficacy and a hint of smugness because they are the objects of such tender solicitude. This was made vivid in the 2004 town meeting uh, American presidential debate between Bush and Kerry, to which only undecideds and independents were invited, and this continues. The headline of the Pew Foundation's 2009 study, Trends in Political Values and Core Attitudes, reads, Independence Takes Center Stage in the Obama Era. Since the 2008 election, the percentage of Americans self-described as independent has increased to 36% compared to 35% Democrats and 23 Republicans, but this is a moving figure. What's more important is that Pew concludes, as a group, individuals remain difficult to pin down. And this confirms their self-reporting from another manifesto. I've met independent voters whose political views span the entire ideological spectrum, from ultra-conservative to ultra-liberal. Independent voters are impossible to pigeonhole, and this is a point of pride. So weightlessness comes from the fact that whatever their numbers, independents are not sending a coordinated message, even if hapless political analysts are in the business of trying to interpret what their votes meant. On occasion, nonpartisan voters may decide an election, but to say that they throw an election one way or the other is misleading because there is no they there. Simply, the vicissitudes of their votes have that unplanned effect. Independents don't take responsibility for the institutions that organize public discussion and elections and government, and they're not responsible to other like-minded citizens. They do not owe or offer justifications to any group. The independent is politically unreliable, although political scientists today don't portray this as querulousness in Henry Adams' words as a mask for political vacillation, weakness, 
inconstancy of temperament or an excuse for self-indulgence. Nevertheless, a potential army of independents appeals to the political imagination of anti-partisans and arouses hope that they will be the correctives to partisanship. Early feminists were very vocal on this point. Frances Gilman described political parties as institutional expressions of inextricable masculinity and anticipated that once women had the vote, a flourishing democratic government could be carried on without parties at all. Which is why the weightlessness of independence is the perennial worry of anybody who wants to organize them as agents of democratic reform. Even Teddy Roosevelt warned against what he called mere windy anarchy. He was wary of the sheer disorganization of independence or their uh, inclination to promiscuous coalitions. And schemes for creating an independent party typically fail, amongst other reasons, because learning to act in accordance with a script that they don't write themselves is what the core of political organizing is and is precisely what independence can't abide. And a recent example, the most recent example I know of is this party called Unity 08. It was the first all online party. It was formed by former Democratic and Republican Party leaders proposing to attract independence. And this party did enlist online 100,000 members, but it never found candidates or a platform. Still, the progressive goal of giving weight to independence persists. And the most notable place is when it comes um, to the signature progressive reform, still going on today, which is the direct primary election. The progressive idea was to replace backroom caucuses with legally mandated direct state primaries in the open air. And hopes for organizing independence and seizing control from partisans are one impetus behind ongoing legal battles today over the form the primary election should take and over who should make that decision. And the best known example is a case the two Dartmouth faculty have written ab about brilliantly, and that's California's Proposition 198, which was passed by popular referendum in 1996, and it changed the state system from a traditional closed party primary to what was called a blanket primary that required the state to list all candidates randomly on a single ballot, and it allowed voters, regardless of their party affiliation, to vote for any candidate from any party for any office. And this meant that elections to choose a party's nominee are open to independents and to undecideds and to crossover voters from rival parties, to those who at best refused to affiliate with a party and at worst had expressly affiliated with a rival and whose voters are, votes are potentially decisive. The blanket primary was uh, likened to, some of you may uh, see more to this than I did, was likened to letting, to letting UCLA's football team choose USC's head coach. Well, we don't have to see the problem as one of strategic rating. It's enough to say that an amorphous group of nonpartisans potentially selects the nominee that carries the party's name. And of course, producing nominees and positions other than those that partisans would choose if left to their own devices was the whole point of this change. California's traditional closed primary system, the advocates insisted, and you should recognize this line, favors the election of party hardliners and stacks the deck against moderate problem solvers. So plainly, this California initiative exhibited more than a whiff of aversion to partisanship. It charged parties with turning off voters and with depressing participation. It identified partisans with extremists. It described those who would not affiliate with a party in order to vote in a primary as disenfranchised. It would have used electoral laws to lock in a particular theory of party competition, centrism. Democratic, Republican, and several minor party leaders challenged the law, which was struck down by the Supreme Court in 2000. And this prompted something much more threatening, I think, to parties and institutions, that is the nonpartisan primary enacted by referendum in the state of Washington that I talked about earlier. And I understand, I was just at UCLA giving a talk, and I understand that California may have soon another initiative on the ballot for a nonpartisan primary. In sum, I think that independence should not be conceded the moral high ground. As Pew reports, independents are fickle, they're ungrounded, they're liable to mistrust, and in particular, they are distinctively of two minds about the scope and role of government. They vote for one or another candidate, but in fundamental ways, they remain undecided. And I think that solicitude for independence 
as well as partisan divisiveness. It is what makes it so dizzying for elected officials today to articulate in advance bold policy changes, or even for that matter, incremental ones. So, posed against the luster of independence is partisanship. What is there to appreciate? In contrast to democratic theorists, political scientists have and continue to uh, define democracy in terms of parties and competition amongst parties for votes, and they make certain important instrumental arguments for the value of parties and partisanship. They point to partisanship as the ballast of a democratic system. For example, <coughs> they point to the role that partisans play in forming majorities and in organizing legislatures. And above all, political scientists focus on the demonstrable relationship between party identification and high levels of participation. So if we think that the simple act of voting is the ground upon which the edifice of elective government rests, ultimately, we might expect that when the percentage and the demographics of non-voters raises the alarm of democratic failing, that partisanship would have its defenders. But even here, very few democratic theorists find anything to appreciate in the fact that without partisans pronouncing grievances and pointing up dangers and arousing resentment and naming antagonists, it is unimaginable how citizens become agents with opinions rallied for the contest. My appreciation of partisanship is going to take a different turn, however. I'm going to focus on the moral distinctiveness of party ID. So three notes of appreciation now for partisanship. They correspond to the three elements of an ethic of partisanship that I've proposed. One is the inclusive character of party ID, which is characteristic, though not unique, to partisanship in the United States. At its most basic, partisanship is identification with Republicans from Florida to California and with political competition on almost every level of government. And there's no other political identity that's shared by so many segments of the American population as measured by socioeconomic status or religion or re region. And partisans are not clumped tightly together on an ideological spectrum either. Now, this <coughs> is not to say that all partisans have a deep moral commitment to inclusiveness in all its social forms only that they're ambitious to be in the majority. And to be clear, claiming a majority is more than just a strategic requirement of institutional design. After all, partisans want to win elections, but often a plurality can suffice. They want to have their policies enacted, but there are other often more effective avenues of political advocacy and influence than partisanship. Rather, partisans want the moral ascendancy that comes from earning the approval of the great body of the people. They want a majority and more. And persuading a majority of the people over a broad swath of socioeconomic status and region and preserving it over more than one electoral moment is a triumph. And in this respect, partisan inclusiveness is a conscious democratic value. Candidates, of course, <coughs> may have short-term strategic interests or they may have safe seats that allow them to speak only to the base or to activate, activate only certain voters. So that non-voting is an effect of what's misnamed mobilization, not its antithesis. They're liable to be opportunistic. But civilian partisans aspire to persuade and mobilize as many as possible and to secure not just their vote in this election, but their identification with them as partisans. And their horizon of political expectation extends beyond a single election cycle, and they aim at creating this inclusive we. The second element of an ethic of partisanship and ground for appreciation is attachment to others in a group <coughs> with responsibility for telling a comprehensive public story about the economic or social or moral or uh, uh, changes of the time, or about national security. Of course. Partisans sometimes focus on a specific issue or event and their party's uh, ideas and the competence to deal with it. And of course, partisans pursue partial interests. But this is not unreconstructed interest group pluralism. 
since they share a complex of concerns and they connect their particular interests and opinions to a more general conception of the public interest. Now, it would be overstating the case to say that partisans assume the obligation that the philosopher John Rawls articulated, and I'm quoting, to advance a conception of the public good that is situated in the most complete conception of political justice we can advance. That's overstating it. On the other hand, it's understating it, the case to say merely that in contrast to members of interest group or particular advocacy groups, partisans are not single issue voters. What is the case <laughs> is that partisans do not hold to a single value of policy as uniquely important, that they identify with a complex of concerns that's continuously refined and rearranged. And there's an important result of the comparative comprehensiveness of partisanship relative to other political identities. And that's that ordinary partisans are seldom extremists, by which I mean they seldom adhere single-mindedly to one dominant idea. The extremist is one-eyed, monotonic, not just right, but right on a particular matter of such singular urgency that it eclipses all competing matters and suppresses all cautions and rationalizes unfortunate consequences. Now, I'm trying not to use the term extremist loosely. Extremism is a careless and destructive charge when it's leveled wholesale and used as a vitriolic synonym for partisanship generally. On the other hand, it would be wrong to think that in public discourse today, when people talk about extremism, it's a thoughtful reference to a specific position on an ideological spectrum. It's rarely that. I think there's a helpful way to understand extremist applied to partisans today. And I think that it indicates, in the end, a falling off from the elements that I've identified as the ethic of partisanship. Extremist signals a failure to be inclusive, to take responsibility for persuading and mobilizing voters other than purists. It signals a failure of comprehensiveness, single-mindedly taking one idea or aim to its limit being indifferent and unresponsive to the range of concerns facing the nation. And by its failing, extremism points to a third element of an ethic of partisanship, and that's what I call the disposition to compromise. Inclusiveness and a comprehensive account of what needs to be done are only possible if partisans also demonstrate the disposition to compromise. And here I'm talking about the disposition <coughs> to compromise with one another. We know what compromise typically entails. Tolerance of small gains, getting less than we want in order to get something, settling for less in order to prevent something worse. We also know, vivid today, that the hardest compromises are often intra-party within the party. And the compromise with fellow partisans is an obligation. It's part of creating and acknowledging and sustaining this partisan we. And so um, my account of ex uh, extremism is a failure to exhibit the moral disposition necessary to do this work. Because extremists represent intransigence as a virtue, and they do not find failure ignominious. Now, it's also true that compromise can be evidence of abject pandering or of raw opportunism. Uh, the term compromising often has a moral taint to it. But if any of you are partisans, I think you know for yourselves that working out the bounds of reasonable compromise is really part of the very stern discipline of partisanship. And I'm going to come back to this. Intra-party conflicts rage over every aspect of campaigning and governing and opposition. What interests and issues are the crucial lines of political division? What message is communicated by a certain position in the politics of the moment? What ideas or interests or candidates fall outside the bounds and are unfaithful to the soul of the party. So inclusiveness and comprehensiveness and compromisingness set the contours for an ethic of partisanship. Clearly, they also provide standards for criticizing partisanship. And finally, I think, they point to the overarching achievement of partisanship, and then they point ahead to what I call the moral distinctiveness of party ID. So, inclusiveness, comprehensiveness, and compromisingness enable what I take to be this distinctive work of partisanship and the achievement of political parties 
which is drawing politically relevant lines of division and shaping the system of conflict that orders democratic deliberation and decision. Party antagonism focuses attention on problems. Information and interpretations are brought out. Stakes are delineated. Points of conflict and commonality are located. The range of possibilities is winnowed. And relative competence on different matters is up for judgment. Without party rivalry, democracy's theory of trial by discussion cannot be meaningful. This is my argument. It will not be if the inclusion of interests and opinions is exhaustive and chaotic and parties are about selection and exclusion. Nor will it be fruitful if interests and opinions are disorganized and are brought into opposition and their consequences are unanticipated and the argument is evaded. Politically salient positions are unlikely to be cast as a serious conflict of opposing reasons unless partisans do the work of advocating on the side of the angels. Shaping conflict is what partisans do. And what will not be done, certainly not regularly and reasonably coherently, in the way that representative democracy requires without them. This account that I've given of the achievement of partisanship speaks directly to my colleagues, to contemporary democratic theorists, who all prize democratic deliberation. They prize deliberation that includes a variety of perspectives. But at the same time, they ignore or reject partisanship. In fact, the clash of uh, political beliefs and the interests and attitudes that are likely to influence them, that John Rawls and other political philosophers concede is a normal condition of human life, do not <laughs> spontaneously assume a form amenable to democratic debate and decision. And parties are not simply reflections, automatic reflections, of cleavages that are there in society any more than they adopt fully developed conceptions of justice that exist antecedent to political activity. Party competition is constitutive. It creates a system of conflict. It stages the battle. That is, partisans do. And attempting to capture this, the incomparable political scientist of parties, Maurice Duferger, used language that moves back and forth between metaphors of natural and artistic creation. He writes, parties crystallize, coagulate, synthesize, smooth down, mold. Creativity in politics is very rarely a subject of political theory. And when it comes up, it's always identified with founding moments or constitutional design, or with higher lawmaking, or with transformative social movements, or with revolution, and not with normal politics. Partisanship, I argue, is the ordinary, not ordinarily extraordinary, locus of political creativity. Now this achievement of parties is regularly disparaged. And to bring this point home, I want to return to the blanket primary case, the California Democratic Party v. Jones case. The question for the court in that case was whether the asserted state interest in increasing voter turnout by allowing independents and, uh, on, and uh, rival party uh, members to vote outweighed the party's claim that the blanket primary was compelled association in violation of their constitutional First Amendment right of association. That is, their right to determine how inclusive the process of candidate selection should be and agenda setting should be at what stage. Well, the Supreme Court actually ruled California's blanket primary unconstitutional. It ruled in the party's favor, but not because it acknowledged the primary elections were an important fora for the business of parties and partisanship. It sided, the court sided with parties strictly on the basis of their own constitutional precedents when it came to right of association. And the, as I said, the Washington state nonpartisan primary was a response to this Supreme Court ruling. I bring it up again because from the point of view of political theory, from the perspective of democratic theory, we see that the significance of party autonomy here isn't just a constitutional right of association. The significance of party autonomy has to do with what we understand to be the role and achievement of partisans. The worth of our right to vote doesn't exist apart from the institutional framework in which it's exercised. And the meaningfulness <coughs> of our vote is going to be dependent on the political identity of parties and their candidates. That is centrally, it's going to depend on the achievement of parties in drawing lines of division. 
Political identity is refined and tested at the primary stage of elections, where parties select their candidates and, and driving issues. And the effect of a legally mandated blanket primary would not just be to alter the identity of the candidate, in some ways that's the least of the problems, but to subvert the whole business of partisanship, which is drawing these lines of division. So, I've proposed three elements of an ethic of partisanship, and I've identified what I take to be the overarching achievement of parties. And finally, I want to make good on the title of my talk, The Moral Distinctiveness of Party ID. Commitment to political pluralism, to regulated political rivalry, and to shifting responsibility for government makes party ID the morally distinctive political identity of representative democracy. I'm going to put this simply in other terms. While thinking that they should speak to everyone, partisans don't imagine that they speak for the whole or that their victory is anything but partial and temporary. Now it's true. Partisans are on the side of the angels, offering a satisfactory account of what needs to be done. But however ardent and devoid of skepticism, there is this reticence. And that's the moral distinctiveness of party ID. Partisans don't imagine that their party speaks for the whole. Even in power, they're not the nation. Tocqueville observed that parties in America know, and everyone knows, that no party represents everyone or even a permanent majority. This fact, he wrote, results from their very existence. But it requires a real stern self-discipline to acknowledge partiality when there's a powerful urge to claim the mantle of the nation and to pretend to represent all <coughs> thoughtful Americans. Tony Blair, when he was prime minister, I think lacked this reticence when he declared his ambition to make the Labor Party into the political wing of the British people as a whole. By contrast, Barack Obama exhibited this reticence when he said on the night of the New Hampshire primary, you can be the new majority who can lead this nation out of a long political darkness. Our new American majority can end the outrage. Partisans accept political rivalry, regulated rivalry, and the fact that this political conflict is iterative. They keep the losing side in view, on the ready, not just to alter a particular outcome, but to have their party take responsibility for governing. They don't secede or revolt or withdraw in defeat, and elections are not followed by waves of suicide. Now, as one colleague once said, it's true, Greatness is made of sterner stuff than successfully facing the exigencies of the electoral cycle. Well, maybe, but political aspirants must channel their ambitions through this collective, constraining, typically unheroic institution. And they do have to endure the terror of the opposition's vigilance and exposure. And for we ordinary citizens, partisans, partisanship entails the hard knocks of compromise and defeat. One more iteration of this point. Partisanship is the political identity that doesn't see political pluralism and conflict as about a necessity or a glum concession to the ineradicable <coughs> circumstances of politics. We might think that the vicissitudes of political fortune and the limits of human vol volition would make this existentially true, a felt experience. Or we might say that all democratic citizens or voters have a part in this moral distinctiveness, as they do formally, I guess, in the abstract. We've seen, however, that often democratic citizens see political argument as unnecessary and political conflict as illegitimate. They value independence detachment or pragmatism or above all consensus. It's partisans who assume the task of shaping a system of political conflict. We know that in political life, Partiality and disagreement are probably inescapable, and so are groups and associations of all kinds organized in opposition to one another. But except when we're reading the news from fragile democracies, we tend to forget that parties and partisanship are not inevitable and should not be taken for granted. And so between high-minded disapproval on the one hand and taking partisanship for granted on the other, I think we're liable to lose sight of the achievement. Now, one last thing. If, if anti-partisanship were simply of the moment, if I were just talking about right now, skeptics of my appreciation of partisanship might be forgiven. After all, recent experience in American politics has fueled anti-partisan and anti-partisanship. Party leaders often seem to want to destroy one another as a legitimate opposition. 
their hubristic claiming to represent the nation, not a part, compromise even with their fellow partisans doesn't seem to be in their repertoire, even if the public business doesn't get done. And so the thrust of my ethic of partisanship is critical as well as appreciative. Falling off from this ethic of partisanship doesn't make my characterization an idealization, and it's not a reason to constrain or circumvent parties <coughs> and partisanship, and it's certainly no reason to prize independence or to anticipate post-partisanship. That would be a hopeless idealization and a, a misguided uh, abandonment of what I take to be the distinctive political identity of representative democracy. Because what we need is not independence or post-partisanship, but better partisanship, which is all the more reason for democratic theorists to connect the practice of democratic citizenship with partisanship and to consider the conditions of better partisanship as seriously as they do impartiality and independence and institutions designed to work without parties or partisanship. Parties remain, in a famous phrase, the orphans of political philosophy. And democratic theorists, I've argued, should adopt them and take them in. Thank you. I'm happy to take questions. Yeah. It, it, seems, it seems to me that we're citizens in a pluralistic society, but we're living in a, a partisan duopoly, that really what you're critiquing is two-partyism and not partisanship, and that this problem is unique to the United States and perhaps the, the lesson we learned in the newly democratized countries of the world is that they didn't adopt our model. They didn't adopt a duopoly in a partisan way. How would you respond to that? Um, well, first of all, <laughs> I'm not a critic of the two-party system, although I, I, for a variety of reasons. I mean, there, there are pros and cons, which both political theorists and political scientists can point out to PR systems, multi-party systems versus our two-party system. I think it certainly is a serious criticism if you think that the parties have entrenched themselves so that they district in order to have safe seats or they, they create election laws that make it impossible for other candidates in, in, in the new parties and so on to enter. I think that that is a problem and, the quest and, and, and a serious criticism. And the question for legal scholars has been, how do you get around that? And there are a variety of proposals. Some states have independent commissions that make these kinds of decisions. But what's interesting in, in the election law scholarship today is the claim that the Supreme Court should be the regulator of the democratic system and should take all kinds of actions to prevent the entrenchment, the self-entrenchment of not just one party, but the, the sort of duopoly of the parties working together. And I think that this is a problem. That is, I think that political competition is an important, although not the exclusive, uh, important or standard of a democratic system. But per se, I'm not a, 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 an opponent of uh, two-partyism in the United States. Uh, for that matter, nor am I uh, necessarily a critic of polarized parties in the United States. Well, I think the, the argument that I've made is that that's not necessarily true. That is that there are a variety of kinds of independence and that what the political identity of independence typically is, is anti-partisan. And uh, that, that there are these fundamentalists, <coughs> that the only form of independence that you might say conforms to what you're describing or what I've said, circumstantial independence. That is, they think that these particular parties, entrenched as they are and of the sort that they are, don't correspond to the political judgments that they think are important to have in, in politics. And whether that really is a circumstantial judgment. And if the parties were different, right, in some ways, whether they were more centrist for some of them or more, more um, uh, 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 differentiated for others, whether that would end their anti-partisanship is something that might be true, but that I'm skeptical of. That is that I think that independence is a political identity that's opposed to partisanship per se. That, that the luster of independence, the form that it's taken here, has to do with this proud self-designation and not wanting, and which is one of the reasons why it's 
but it's very hard to organize these people into anything or in, even into several things. And, and ju just to reiterate the point that I made early on in the lecture, it's, I'm not identifying independence with simply voters or citizens who have no preference between these parties because they don't like it, right? I'm identifying independence with those people who designate themselves as having this thing called a political identity called independence. Hi. Hi. Um, oh, thank you. Right, so it seems as though your argument is a timely one in the sense that the kinds of citizens you're talking about didn't exist 100 years ago or 50 years ago or in any substantial numbers or even 30 years ago, right? It's since the 90s that we see a real movement toward identifying oneself as an independent. <coughs> and so in that sense, um, it may be true that uh, political philosophy and Amer long-standing American values add luster to um, that political identity, right? As an, as an intellectual matter, we've prized indep independence for quite a while. Um, socially and economically in America, we've prized independence for quite some time. But it can't be the case that those trends or those traditions explain where these citizens or this kind of citizen identity is coming from because that seems to have bubbled up again in the last 20 years or so. Um, so I guess I'm curious as to where you think that's coming from, why you think there's been this trend. Um, you mentioned David Brooks in your talk, and he has some ideas about what's going on in the 90s um, that's producing a, you know, a politics of beyond. Um, I was wondering if you could comment a little bit um, on your views. Yeah. First, let me quibble a little bit about your characterization of the, the novelty of the state of affairs. I think that independence as a political identity, although it hasn't been a label right, that, that pollsters use, right? That, that independence as a political identity, as explicit nonpartisanship, as not wanting to be identified with either of the parties, as not being taken for granted, is a recurrent phenomenon in American politics. And it was virtually everything that's said and written today could have been said and written at the turn of the century during the progressive years. So, so it's not new. What is new is uh, polling and calibrating these things. And when pollsters beginning to provide you with this category, right? Are you, uh, do you have no preference? Are you a Democrat? Are you uh, are independent? Are you leaning independent? Are you a pure independent? I mean, so what's new is our calibration and, and ability to poll for this. But I think that the phenomenon is not new. Now, I don't want to blame it on pollsters and political scientists, right? So I think that if, if you want to say that there has, that, that although this phenomenon is not a new, no, new, that it's a recurrent phenomenon in American politics, that it has, deep cultural and political culture roots of the sort I described still is the question, why now? And there are answers the political scientists give to this that I think have, have are, are parts of the puzzle. I mean, the, the, the part of the puzzle that they don't talk about is what I talked about today. But the parts of the puzzle that they talk, talked about are, first of all, the real decline in the nature of political parties and political party organization over time that political parties used to offer patronage, and they used to mobilize voters in a particular way, and they used to have, uh, make this connection of party identification, and that parties themselves as organizations have ceased to be membership groups, that, it's no, that it, they, they have, they have uh, backed off from the business of making and keeping <coughs> partisans. And, there are explanations for why they've been able to do so. They've been able to do so because of the nature of campaigning today, or they've been able to do so because of the difficulty of, and the expensiveness of doing that, and there are a variety of organizational and technological explanations for why uh, parties have changed in that way. And what we saw in the last election, which I think is, is really quite interesting, um, is the uh, attempt for the first time in a long time by the Democratic Party to attend to partisanship, right? To do grassroots political organizing. Remember Howard Dean terribly criticized for what was called his 50 state strategy, right? He was gonna set up party offices in 50 states, right? And not just in 50 states, in, in localities, in, in um, uh, counties, right? Wherever you want a political organization. And he put a lot of party money into doing this and it is very expensive. And 
and the Obama campaign sort of reinforced that in a variety of ways. I will be very interested to see whether this continues. I'm quite skeptical about whether in this day and age the parties will put this kind of money and organizational effort into these, into these things. So we'll, we'll see. But they, they are reaping the whirlwind of not, of not doing it. Hi. Um, I was wondering whether, in your view, the moral distinctiveness of party ID dissipates in a multi-party system. Um, and I was just thinking of the political system of France, for example. And it seems like the parties there are too numerous to count. Wikipedia, I just looked it up, says that there are 18, and four of them are on the far right. So those parties aren't inclusive, and they're not comprehensive, and they don't have a disposition to compromise. So do you think that when they form a winning coalition, that the parties that are part of that coalition like regain the ethics of partisanship? <coughs> and does that mean that the parties that don't form the winning coalition are not entitled to that moral distinctiveness? That's, that's a great question. And I'm, I'm not going to be able to answer it to your satisfaction. This book and this talk is largely about American and a few other party systems that have what we think of as large umbrella parties. And um, I, ha I have talked to and, and, and blogged with, which is now what you do, uh, <laughs> comparative political scientists on this question, to the extent to which what I've described extends to other party systems. And the consensus seems to be that it, it does, but not. Because remember, my ethics of partisanship is not descriptive. It's a standard of what you ought to do, that, that every party, unless it's really a segmented party in a divided society, right? ought to be engaged in speaking to everyone, right? Ought to want to maximize its membership, ought to be willing to compromise, and so on and so forth. The, there's, a, there's an orthodoxy in political science about, about the, the trade-offs in a two-party or umbrella party system in a PR system, and I'm sure some of you know, know all about it. I'm, systems that are multi-party, wh who was I talking to in, in Sonu's class from Italy? Oh, Oh yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, that, that's the extreme. I, that what PR and multi-party systems do successfully is that they don't require compromise on the front side, right? Because partisan can find some spot on the spectrum, right? Or some party that seems to reflect their views. But the translation of that into the formation of a government and policy is much less predictable, right? Than what goes on uh, in, in a two-party system. But your question was, was really about does the, my ethics of partisanship apply? And I, if I were to work this out, which I probably will try to do, I think that it applies somewhat, but imperfectly. Yes. Blue shirt? Hi. So um, I guess I was listening to what you said about independence, and I, some of the words you used, uh, weightless and um, sort of unengaged in politics. And uh, I really, first of all, don't feel like that's true. Maybe, maybe of some independence, but not of all independence, not myself, for instance. So I was wondering if, if you could comment on that. And then also... Well, you have to uh, comment on that. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, sorry, but I mean, <laughs> ab about characterizing independence in that way, it, it almost seems like lumping them into a group just like partisans, which, whereas you said that they're not lump, able to lump into a group. And then secondly, uh, I understand that political parties are sort of essential for competition in a, in a political system, and from time to time have considered joining one as, but then I hear statements from party leaders that are just so totally devoid of substance, and it's all about how the the opposing party is failing the American people and uh, <coughs> failing to govern properly. And it, it seems like so much of what political parties talk about, whether it's organizing people or trying to discredit the other party, is not concerned with the actual business of politics, which is making 
which I see as making laws that will actually benefit the country and the people of the country. So if parties are if parties are just focusing on rhetoric and gaining members rather than providing solutions, are they really following this ethic or are they uh, I guess I just don't understand how parties can be all about just organizing people and being <coughs> inclusive and not about substantive solutions to the nation's problems. Okay, so you, you've asked two different things. You've said, I'm wrong in my characterization of independence. Um, and I, I, I really don't think so. I mean, <laughs> I, 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 didn't, I didn't claim that no independent is interested in politics, right, or is well informed. I took what are the claims made about independence today for their superiority over partisans and tried to dissect them. Right? That, I mean, th that was the, the sort of character and dynamic of, of the argument. And for your, f to you, because you are like my students, uh, uh, very well informed and politically active and engaged independent, um, the most important challenge for you, for you in answering me is the weightlessness challenge. That is, if you, that it, isn't it your obligation as somebody who is politically engaged and interested? I'm not saying that all citizens have to vote, and I'm certainly not saying that you know, everybody has to be active in partisanship. There are all kinds of other political activity, and I was married to somebody who never voted. So you know, I'm completely tolerant. But once you're in it, once you're you, right, then don't you have some responsibility for the institutions that organize the lines of division that make up democratic politics today. And you cannot take on that responsibility as an independent unless you're interested in doing political organizing of independence, which I think is a hopeless task. So the, the, other, the, other, the other part of your question is, you know, the sort of s standard claim about aren't partisan politicians today, and this, this talk was mainly about we partisans, right, or uh, uh, civilians. Aren't partisan politicians today just negative and so on and so forth? And I have a lot of things to say to that. Uh, first of all, I think that um, the fact that parties are engaged in pointing out the errors of the opposition or the failings of the opposition or the incompetence of the opposition is part of their job. <laughs> I mean, I think that that's what they do. And to say that that's all, the only thing they do in those sort of abstract and negative terms I think is, is a misrepresentation of the last elections we've been through. I mean, we, we have been through a period of American politics where we have very clearly defined parties with severe both policy and ideological differences where it matters <laughs> who's in office. So, I, you know, I don't, and, and where the outcome of politics I think has been very, very substantial depending upon what party is in control and what compromises they make or don't make. I mean, it is, a, it is an orthodoxy of the moment that we have such polarized parties in Congress today that nothing's getting done. Now, here I'm stepping out of my role as political theorist, obviously. <coughs> These two years, and it'll be two years in the November election, an enormous amount has gotten done. You may not like the outcomes of these things. You may not think they're good parties. But can you imagine, think of a two-year period in which more important policies were made, in which, in which more substantive things were done, in which more money wasn't spent, in which education policy and stabilization and buyouts and probably a health care bill and a tax bill and a jo jobs bill. And I mean, what do you all want? I mean, this, this is active partisan politics. And again, you may not like the outcomes. You may have thought that the parties drew the lines of division wrong. You may have thought that the policy agenda that they took up was the wrong order of policy agenda. But I'm not making an argument for or against one party. I'm making an argument for the significance and the necessity of a certain kind of partisan politics and, um, in a sense, the obligation of citizens who are engaged in this to pay attention to partisanship. Yes, in the blue, sh yeah. I just had a, I just had a question about the recent sort of the Tea Party movement and which likes to characterize itself as independent while calling itself a party, 
And I was just wondering how you feel that uh, fits into your idea of independence. Neither I nor anyone, so far as I can tell, can make hide their hair out of the, <laughs> out of the Tea Party movement. I mean, I clearly, I think, I think clearly that many of them are what we call conservative. I think mainly what we're seeing is a group of people who are angry and anti-government. And um, you know whether they turn out to be politically independent or whether they all turn out actually to be Republican partisans, I don't know. I think what's significant about them is not that. What's significant about them, if they're significant, and I'm agnostic on that, is that they are a canary in the mine of anti-governmentalism. I mean, we, we have seen this, too, is a long story in American politics, right, of not wanting government action. And can I just say one thing apropos of this, and then I'll, I'll, I'll stop. Um, I'm, I've gotten quite interested in the subject of political compromise, and I've started to write some papers on this, because there's actually very little written, certainly in political theory, on, uh, on political compromise. And, and one of the things I've, I've become conscious of, and this is to the Tea Party, is that you don't have political compromise unless you want political action, right? I mean, that's what compromise is all about. It's to get something done, right, to get some action. And there are a lot of impediments to political compromise in American politics, but one of them is, one of them is the very deep and very widespread disinterest in, in having political action, in governmental action. And where you have a strong resistance to getting things done, in fact, um, uh, you're, you're gonna ha you have a kind of obstacle to political compromise, because that's what it's about. I'll take one more question. Just see if there's another student. Yeah. Uh, could you quickly explain then the Perot phenomenon? Was that just collective weightlessness of 20 million people? Uh, no, I think that the Perot phenomenon was potentially very important for a uh, variety could a of reasons. plausible argument not be made if Colin Powell had run in a subsequent election, he would have drawn quite a larger sector of society? No, absolutely. Perot was interesting for, I think, two main reasons. One is that he was a centrist candidate, right? And, and he was, in a sense, the proof of the pudding for political scientists who argue that centrism is the way to go in American politics. And on all of these issues, right, the parties were not hitting the mark, and he had found the mark. I mean, I think that's right. And, and, and the other interesting thing about Perot for me was the failure to exploit this moment. I mean, I don't know that you would ever have had a really com competitive in independent party, whatever he called, well, I forget what he called his party. Um, but, but a reform party, right. But he didn't try, nor did his people try. I mean, this, he had a candidate, he had a vice presidential candidate, and he didn't do party building. It is hard, it is expensive, and nobody wants to do it. And in effect, therefore, Perot was what we have pretty frequently, which is an independent candidate, but not a party, and there was nowhere to go. And I have to say that one of the interesting things to me about the sort of Christian right in this country is that you know, th they never tried to form their own party. They tried to have influence within the Republican Party. But what they did do was very basic grassroots party organizing, and they went after school boards <laughs> right, and over city councils, and they began to develop what really looks like a party organization, a party movement. Now, I think that they were um, inherent constraints to how far they could go, and they hit them. But they did what Perot or somebody would have had to do to build, build a party. And I think we'll stop there. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>